Let's now configure a single area OSPF router. Given this topology, we have three locations, the data center, main and remote branch. The entire network must be configured with OSPF version 2 area 0. And it should use OSPF 2 with a process ID of 1. But before configuring OSPF 2, make sure each router interface has an IP address and is up. To configure OSPF, we use this command to enable the OSPF process on router 1, where 1 is the OSPF process ID. Next command is defining the networks to advertise. We use this command which tells OSPF which interfaces to enable and which networks to advertise. 0.0.0.255 is the wildcard mask or the inverse of subnet mask. And this sets the area ID to 0. Next is optional but important, which is to set the router ID. We use the command router ID and the router ID to be used. We can use the following commands to verify the OSPF configuration. Let's start with verifying the OSPF neighbors. We can use the show IP OSPF neighbor command to help verify that routers have formed OSPF neighbor relationships. In this example output, it shows the neighbor ID, state, dead time, IP address, and interface of the OSPF neighbors. The state means the OSPF adjacency state. Full means fully adjacent, which is good. DR and BDR are designated and backup designated router respectively. Another state can be a full or a DR other which means full adjacency and neither a DR or BDR. And there's also the two-way or DR other state which is a two-way neighboring that's neither a DR or BDR. So, if you don't see neighbors in full state, OSPF adjacency is not fully established. Next is verify the enabled interfaces. We can use the command show IP OSPF interface brief and it's useful for quickly checking which interfaces are running OSPF, their area, and state. In this example output, we can see the different interfaces running OSPF. The state means network type and role. It can be BDR, DR, or DR other. Or P2P for point-to-point -point links. So, we can see here that on interface GIG00, router 1 is the BDR with two neighbors fully adjacent. The next command displays OSPF learned routes in the routing table. We can use the command show IP route OSPF to see the OSPF learned routes in the routing table. In this example output, the letter O means the route is learned via OSPF. So, if you don't see O routes, it means OSPF isn't learning or advertising properly. So, for a quick summary, we use show IP OSPF neighbor to check if neighbors form adjacency and look for the full state. We use show IP OSPF interface brief to see which interfaces run OSPF, their area, cost, and state. And we use show IP route OSPF to confirm OSPF is populating the routing table with learned routes. Let's now discuss the OSPF passive interface which is a feature that is very commonly used in real-world deployment. Normally, when you enable OSPF on an interface, it advertises the subnet so other routers learn about it. It also sends hello packets trying to form neighbor relationships. But not every interface has another router connected so this is where passive interface comes in. Why do we need passive interface? Without passive interface, router wastes resources sending hello packets where no router exists. But with passive interface, the subnet is still advertised into OSPF. And no hellos are sent or received on the interface that doesn't need it. 
This saves resources and improves security so end hosts won't see OSPF packets. Here are common uses of passive interface. They are commonly used for access networks where interfaces connecting to PCs or switches with no routers. And this is how we can configure OSPF passive interface. First, we use the command router OSPF1 to enable the OSPF process with the process ID 1 on the router. Then, we use the command passive interface gig01 to make the gigabit ethernet01 interface passive. No OSPF neighbors can form on this interface. To make all interfaces passive by default, we use the passive interface default command. This is a quick way to stop OSPF hellos everywhere. To re-enable OSPF hellos on an interface, we can use the no passive interface gig00 command. This is the interface where you actually want neighbors to form. Let's now discuss OSPF default route. Let's review what a default route is first. A default route is like a last resort path. If a router doesn't know where to send a packet, it forwards it to the default next hop, allowing routers to forward packets to unknown destinations instead of dropping them. So, even if a router like Router4 here has a static default route, OSPF won't advertise it automatically to its neighbors. To share it with the rest of the OSPF network, you need to configure it first. First, we configure a default static route on the border router, router4. And we use this command to configure it. 192.0.2.1 is the next hop ID. Then, we can use the command default information originate to tell the OSPF to advertise that default route. Now, Router4 advertises this default route to Router1, 2, and 3 using OSPF. And this makes Router4 an ASBR or Autonomous System Boundary Router. But what if the ISP link fails? Router4 will remove the default from its own table and will send a Type 5 LSA with infinite metric, so other routers delete the default route too. And if the router loses its own default route, it stops advertising it to the other OSPF routers. We can also force the router to advertise a default route into OSPF even if it doesn't currently have one in its routing table. We can use the always keyword to advertise unconditionally, and we can add it with the default information originate command. Why do we use it? One reason is routing stability. Without always, if the ISP link keeps flapping, the default route will appear or disappear constantly. With always, the router keeps advertising the default no matter what, preventing instability inside the OSPF domain. Just be careful that if not planned, unconditional defaults can cause routing loops or black holes.